Thank you, Juanjo. And yeah, thanks, um, Kike, and the, all the organizers. A pleasure to be back here in, in Bilbao. So um, I would like to share uh, some of the recent work that we've been doing. So my full-time job is actually at NASA, NASA Ames. That's where I'm a full-time researcher. And, but this work is also in collaboration mainly with, the, uh, with Cubitera. As you can see, it's a, Cubitera is not a startup. It's just actually it's a vehicle. Uh, I will soon be taking a sabbatical time from NASA, and that's the vehicle I'll be actually doing some fun work and some further collaboration. So it's actually just my wife. It's a co-founder, but it's also one of my best friends who happened to be a great physicist, and my brother as well. So we actually, you will see some of the results coming up as well. And this work is also in collaboration with the group of Chris Monroe at the University of Maryland, and also more recently with Rigetti Computing as well. So let me tell you, uh, oops, sorry. Let me tell you uh, a little bit about myself. So I think I've been, uh, since about 10 years and a half, I've been actually programming these quantum devices and coming up with quantum algorithms. So my background is in physics, but uh, since about three years and a half ago, I started leading this effort at NASA on quantum machine learning. So basically, it's more specifically, is in the intersection of quantum assisted, like what can you do with a quantum device and in which task you can accelerate machine learning tasks. So it's quantum assisted machine learning. And one of the questions that I've been, is being very close to my heart is, I think Seth was mentioning this morning, is precisely this question. I mean, that was actually my, my very first PhD project 10 years ago. It was precisely to map a real world problem, it was the lattice protein folding, to adiabatic quantum computation. So I've always been thinking, um, how can, I, how can we actually use these devices, and what are the killer applications for quantum devices, for near-term devices? So basically, notice here I'm actually referring to non-obvious real-world applications, because as you know, the obvious application of a quantum computer is quantum data sets. It's actually is, is, uh, is quantum systems in, in themselves, like quantum chemistry. So what I'm actually, most of my interest has been, can I find applications in the real world in classical data, where actually quantum computers can excel. So that's basically, that's been, that's been driven my research in the last 10 years. And an example of that is combinatorial optimization and machine learning. So those have, those have been the two topics. I had the fortune actually very recently, last year we published this paper. I had the fortune to lead this collaboration with all of these 12 co-authors from many uh, institutions, including government, academia, and, uh, and industry as well. You can see Google, uh, we have also QCWare, who was one of these startups. Xerox Park, who is in the industry. Actually, the application itself that we picked for this paper was actually is what we learned from Xerox, that is actually is 10 minutes away from NASA Ames in, in the Silicon Valley. So basically, I put together all this team, and the question was, what is the power of quantum annealing when actually when you focus on a real-world application? So as you can see here, that's kind of like the summary of the paper. So basically, that's why we needed Helmut Kastraver. He's an expert in, in classical optimization. So he had the, one of the best codes for parallel tempering with isoenergetic cluster moves. So that's a sophisticated a stochastic approach to tackle these problems. We have simulated annealing. We have quantum Monte Carlo. So that's why we had Sergei Isakov, who was one of the best ones in the field. And then basically, we had Safari. It's a technique from uh, Xerox Park. And then, of course, I mean, we also did, we did even, even experiments on the D-Wave machine that we had at NASA. And as you can see, we did all kinds of simulations addressing the power of these technologies. If you had a polynomial representation of the problem, if you have a quadratic, that's quadratic and constraint band optimization, or even actually the instances once you take them to hardware, and basically addressing all these trade-offs. So one of the lessons, actually, and I think it, it comes, uh, there are two points that I wanted to make here is, as you're going to see in the next talk, uh, you can actually machine learn. There are a lot of problems that are entirely just optimization. So you can translate a lot of the machine learning problems to optimization, and that's why, let's say, this contribution is important. And the other one, it goes back to the, to the panel discussion yesterday, where we were discussing basically that, of course, I mean, we all want, I mean, when I talk to my physics friends, they tell me, of course, you need to care about scalability. If you don't have a quantum speed up, or if you cannot prove this, then definitely your work, is, your work is worthless. Basically, you really need to prove that you have a quantum advantage of some sort. But when I talk actually to the machine learning people, they actually they tell me, look, I mean, what I care, I don't, get, I, don't, I don't care about your algorithmic advantage. Actually, what I care is about the performance, or I care about that actually you're using less sample and you have what is called a statistical efficiency. So 
bringing this, actually working in this intersection, I think is, there is a lot to learn. And one of the things, for example, that we learned in this paper is that when you really focus on real world application, you get a nice surprise, actually. All the complexity study from toy models from physics that, for example, Helmut and Matthias Stroyer, they've been fighting over trying to beat the D-way and to show that classic, classical methods actually beat the quantum methods. Actually, these problems were much, much easier than actually these instances coming from real world applications. So it's very important also to come up and study and talk to the people, like Park, Xerox Park, that they have real world applications and see what conclusions can we come up with. So that's kind of like the incentive also for as a machine learning community and coming from the physics background, I'm always trying to stay very close to the experts in machine learning. That has been the take and also the other second half of the talk that you will see is about actually, is, is this other question that has been very close to my heart is about like, what's the power of these devices at the end of the day? How do we even characterize them? How do we can actually measure their power, let's say, in terms of architecture, in terms of gate fidelity, and how that affect actually solving very specific quantum machine learning tasks. So a lot of the insights and, and comments that I will mention here was published, uh, was published in this paper that is gonna appear soon in this, in this invited special issue on what will you do with a thousand qubit device. And basically, so that's basically, we put forward some of the lessons that we learned by actually playing and implementing some of these quantum machine learning on real world devices. And the second half actually of my talk, I will focus on this gate-based type of work, recent work that is the collaboration I mentioned with the group of Chris Monroe. So let me start actually with the, what I would call an insight number one. And it's basically the philosophy of my team when I started this quantum machine learning effort at NASA. The very first thing is, I mean, of course, I mean, there was a lot of excitement work, I mean, exciting work, let's say, from the group of Seth, the group also Hans Briegel about the using reinforcement learning or using actually quantum devices, uh, doing, great, uh, doing a great job in linear algebra type of task that are essentially machine learning. One of the things that we decided to explore is actually is, at NASA we really care about using these devices and seeing the impact in a real world application. So the very first thing we paused and we say, what are the real key applications where actually machine learning experts are struggling at the moment? And that's basically what you will see here is, if you read about, for example, Jeff Hinton, Josh Avenjo, John LeCun, they actually emphasize that, for example, from all the fields and all the things, cool things that you could do in machine learning, where they actually struggle, I mean, actually kind of like the state of the art, what they, they wish they could actually contribute more, that's, that's actually in their supervised machine learning. So that's one of the key topics, let's say, that, that we, we listen to, and actually that's, that's, the, that's the core of our research. The second, actually, comment is that, notice that actually they emphasize as well, in the book, for instance, that we've seen in many, many of the different talks throughout, uh, between yesterday and today, is that actually if you had a way to improve sampling, actually that could make a difference in machine learning. So that's one of the possible research frontiers, for example, for machine learning. And the other thing that you're gonna see, and it's related to some of the work that we've done in the past, is about actually, if you could actually replace Markov chain Monte Carlo, let's say that's another sampling technique, with an efficient way of doing it, actually this would, be, this would be a great way to train and to get better models out of Boltzmann machines. So that's basically, that's basically one of the topics and that's why you're gonna see that the work, let's say, that we've been focusing has been in this paradigm of unsupervised and generative models. Let me explain, in, uh, let me just give you a brief introduction to that, what I mean by unsupervised and what do I mean by generative model. So unsupervised is imagine in machine learning, if you don't have data, you don't have a machine learning type of problem. So you start with data, and in the unsupervised setting, it's called unsupervised because basically you're, giving, you're just giving the raw data. You're not giving labels about what the data is about, just giving you data. The task for you is to come up with a learning algorithm that at the end of the day, for example, you can make some predictions. But mathematically, what you are doing in a generative model, and that's where the, piece, the generative piece come, is what you're trying to describe is the joint probability distribution of each one of the variables. In this case, for example, if we are talking about the image, each one of the pixels in the image would, be, would become a variable. So this is a very complex mathematical object, very high dimensional object. And that's why this task is, I mean, it's very difficult to do math from a mathematical point of view. But what can, what can you do with that? For example, if you have a damaged image, 
Basically, if you know the whole probability distribution over the images, basically you would be able to reconstruct an image, or you could be able to do video completion, or enhance the resolution of some of the images. So those are a few of the examples. What is the other type of machine learning that you see very frequently is the supervised. That is basically one of the hardest topics is precisely because most of the commercial applications rely on this type of machine learning. And the reason why it's so successful is precisely is because that's the one where you can prove that deep learning works. Not about the previous one, it's this one. And basically the difference is that you're giving labels and the task is completely different. You need to come up with an algorithm that at the end of the day, you will do a great job if you manage to come up with a conditional probability distribution that given an image, you can predict the label. As you know, for example, if we are talking about digit recognition, basically the labels is just the digits between zero and 10. So basically this space of this function itself is much, much more reduced. And the task is much simpler. So that's why you see such a tremendous success with this type of techniques. And the task is completely different. For example, the type of things that you can do is that if you're given an image, basically if you can predict what type of digits you have in the image, then you're done, actually. You're doing a great job. And your efficiency will be, will be valued compared to how well you're doing in, in, the, in that task. So let's go back to the generative models. And basically, so what's the second insight about actually using these near-term devices? If you really want to cope with the hardware constraints, and as we know, we're just in a nascent era of these noisy devices, basically, our approach has been to take a hybrid approach. What do I mean by a hybrid approach? Basically, what I do all the time is sit down with the data science people or machine learning people, let's say at NASA, and actually try to dissect the pipeline that they do at work. So basically, they tell me, of course, I mean, you, you need to have data, then you have a learning algorithm, and then you can make some predictions. When you're training your algorithm, basically what I try all the time is to identify what are the intractable pieces where actually, if you had actually a better algorithm, then you could make a difference. And that's when actually I try to plug in a quantum computer to solve this specific task. And in the case of predictions, sometimes actually once you train the model, it doesn't mean that actually doing inference is an easy task. Then I go and see actually if the particular model that they trained is also hard to sample from. And for example, that's another place where you could have a quantum device in place. An example of that, I think actually Seth was mentioned uh, uh, briefly this uh, in, in, in the talk. When you're training a restricted Boltzmann machine, for example, that is basically you have the visible units. So here are your pixels of your image. They will come here. And here are the hidden units that are just trying to capture correlation between the pixels among themselves. When you're training these machines, you need to calculate this type of expectation values. That is basically pairwise correlation between the variables. Between the, between the, it will become actually pairwise correlation between the qubits, but it's pairwise correlation between these two binary variables. And then notice that the average is performed over the joint probability distribution at that joint probability distribution is a Boltzmann machine. So that's why we call Boltzmann sampling, and well, that's why we call them Boltzmann machine. Because basically the model that you use in the background is a Boltzmann distribution. So, of course, if you're gonna calculate averages to calculate, this, to, to estimate these pairwise correlations, then you need samples from this joint probability distribution, and that's not an easy task to do. So that's basically some of the work, I mean, that we highlight in the perspective and basically in the perspective we highlight in particular how difficult it is actually to come up with these models in real world devices. So for example, one of the challenges that we solved in particular in the case of quantum annealers, we realized actually if you understand how these devices work from an open quantum systems perspective, you realize that the temperature, the fridge temperature of the device is completely irrelevant. What actually what matters is the, where they, when in the quantum dynamics actually the system it's frozen. And then actually you need to estimate, your model is gonna be affected by an effective temperature that you need to estimate. If you don't estimate this, actually you will see that basically in that paper that you, you will not be able to make any progress in the learning. So that's basically what we solved there. In this, in this particular paper that was published in Physical Review X, I think for example, I think the first time that I heard from this is uh, is from, from Seth, is actually is that in nature give you lemons, let's make one lemonade, is basically is, is we know from this paper that once you go to the order of hundreds of qubits or 500 qubits, basically 
There is no hope you can sample from a Boltzmann distribution from these devices. Basically, you get all sorts of non-equilibrium effects. You get quantum distributions. You get just the system. The spin dynamics is just too slow to really catch up with the, quant to the thermalization. But still, I mean, the question is, how can we use the samples from this device even if they're we, without caring if it is coming from a quantum distribution or if it is coming from a non-equilibrium distribution? So basically, it's how do you capture that and how do you cope with the constraint limitations that come from actually that the graph in your hardware doesn't match the, the model. And finally, the last, the last contribution here um, in quantum manila is basically in this particular paper, we proposed a way to go beyond uh, binary variables. How do you go to real, uh, to real world data sets? And the paradigm is very simple. Instead of using quantum devices to assist deep learning and to speed up deep learning, we thought of a way how deep learning can assist the representation of the data to compress the data before you pass that to the quantum device. So that's actually, and then the quantum device in itself can assist the whole training of the deep learning procedure. So it's a change of paradigm here that actually allows you to take industrial data sets, by that I mean con data, large data sets with continuous variables. That's something that we cannot do with any of the work, the previous work in, in quantum machine learning. So let me just actually briefly, I will focus in the second half of my talk in this particular paper that is on, on circuits, on quantum circuits. So the task here at hand is, actually we used one of the canonical data sets in machine learning, it's called the bars and stripe. That's the BAS. So bars and stripe, as you can see, is a data set, here, here's a bars and stripe two by two, is basically patterns that look like as you had stripes or bars, in this particular case, those two qualify as well, but patterns like this, they would not qualify as bars and stripes. So out of the 16 possible combinations of four variables. In this case, they're gonna be mapped to four qubit device. Basically, you have only six patterns that you care about. And what you want is your quantum device to be able to match this probability distribution. So, of course, I mean, there are, there, there are many ways to skin the cat. And basically, you can say, oh, I'm just gonna actually come up with a Boltzmann distribution in such a way that I train it and I show the Boltzmann I show the, the algorithm, these patterns, and then in principle I can come up with a Boltzmann distribution. That's one way to do that. But basically what we decided is actually is to completely go away from using the device to sample from Boltzmann distribution and just say, let's the quantum device, the quantum circuit itself, to adjust to the data. And that's basically what is known now as what is called a born machine. So basically all that we do Imagine that actually each one of these patterns is a bit string that actually you're gonna represent in your computational basis. For example, here is the 000, here is the 0101, here is the 0011. Basically what you want from the Born machine, you're using the wave function directly to represent the data. And basically what you do, and that's why you're using the Born amplitudes here, the Born probabilities, is you want to come up with a wave function to train a wave function coming out of the circuit in such a way that when you project on each one of these states, the probability of observing is actually such that, that the probability is uniform in this pattern, so it's large for this pattern, but it's zero on the patterns that you don't want. So that's one way to actually to think of a Born machine in this particular case. Actually, this terminology of Born machine has been used in the case of the quantum tensor network communities and in particular, this paper compared the Born machines versus the Boltzmann machines, but basically, there was no implementation of this or a training algorithms for near-term devices or, or actually an implementation of a quantum circuit. Everything was done theoretically in the, in the framework of tensor networks, on quantum tensor networks. So that's basically what we propose in this paper, and let me show you basically how it works. So it's a hybrid algorithm, and basically imagine that you have your quantum circuit. So you initialize the circuit always with a zero state, and then you apply a series of unitaries. They could be actually single qubit rotations, or it could be entangling gates. And then you alternate that between single qubit rotations and entangling gates. At the end of the day, you do measurements, and as I mentioned, all that you care is the probabilities. So basically, you don't need to do any fancy measurements. It's just directly measuring the computational basis. So that's as simple as, I, as it gets. Now, the trick basically that we play is that we get from the experiment we get a, a histogram that is basically is the probability of each one of these states. 
And then we contrast that with the relative entropy of the KL divergence. We contrast that directly with the, rest, the reference histogram or reference probability distribution that we are trying to learn, and that comes directly from the data. For example, here are the six patterns that comes from the Barsenstein experiment. Well, actually, from the data set itself. And basically, what you do is you see, you contrast these two with a cost function that in this case is the, is the log likelihood that is an approximation of the, log light, uh, of the KL divergence. And basically, you check how well you're doing, and then you update your parameters until the wave function now looks like the Barson stripe data set. Let me tell you a couple of experiments that actually we did uh, on this setting. And uh, the very first experiment, it was the simplest case that you can imagine that is actually is, is a zero temperature ferromagnet. So it's actually it's all it spins down or all it spins up. That's the ground state of that simple. The nice thing, actually, what we are asking the quantum device to do is to come up with a wave function that encodes this. I think you already know the answer to this. It would be a cut state. If you want to encode a wave function to do that, that's basically you need to prepare a cut state in such a way that you get only zeros or only ones. And basically, what was surprising to us is that with, with our procedure, with a, we call it a DDQCL for data-driven quantum circuit learning, once you train the procedure, we were surprised that actually we were able to prepare the, the machine learning procedure, learned the most efficient way to prepare cut states that actually has been implemented on, on ion traps. It was implemented by the group of Rainer Blatt in a, in a PRL paper a while back ago. And it's actually it's implemented through this, what is called a global molmer sorensen type of gates. And this is just an all-to-all XX type of gates among the qubits, on pairs of qubits. And that's why you can implement this very efficient on ion trap. And basically, the nice thing is that we just needed to do experiments on three qubits, four, five, and six. And when you compare the, what you get from the even type of qubits, you come up with this rule. And when you compare, when a human looks at the odd results for the odd number of qubits, you actually, you see that you need this type of rotation to start with. So it was very neat, actually, that we, with no knowledge, actually, of that paper, we were able to come up with the most optimal way to prepare cut states just actually through our DDQCL. Notice here that I'm here not even inputting any quantum correlations to my algorithm, just a completely classical bimodal distribution. That's the simplest distribution that you can come up with, a bimodal distribution. And with that, you can drive the learning of this of preparation of cut states. So, Actually, that's the paper here. That's the, the reference from the, from the implementation that was in 2011. The second experiment that we did is, although, the, although our purpose is not to come up with Boltzmann distributions, we wanted to see, like, from a theoretical point of view, what is actually the power of these quantum circuits to prepare thermal states or distributions that are coming from thermal distributions. So what you see here, we took a sharing torque patrick model, so that's basically it's a spin glass type of system where it's coming with all-to-all -all connectivity, and then basically we, we, we get random samples. We, we, get an, we prepare that ensemble from random, taking a Gaussian distribution of the JIJs and the HIs, and we come up with example. We actually studied the, an ensemble of those experiments, 25 of those. Here is an example. When you go about the critical temperature in the infinite limit, that's the type of histogram that you would get. When you lower the temperature and you go to the critical temperature, that's the histogram that you would get. And actually, when you go to low temperature, you see that actually you have more pronounced peaks as you lower the temperature. We wanted to see what's the power of these circuits as you, as you vary the depth of the circuit and also as you vary actually the, the, the topology. So in this particular case, what I'm showing here is here is also the, the class, one of the classical benchmarks that is called the Bethe, uh, is, is based on the Bethe ansatz. If I ask uh, someone in the statistical physics community to come up with, to solve this problem, what they would do is they would look at this problem as an inverse IC model. So basically, I'm giving the data, and they're supposed to come up with the IC model, so give me back the H's and J's that prepare that, that actually that describe this distribution. So that is basically the inverse Bethe, that's this reference. Notice that for high temperature, the inverse Bethe approach, the classical approach, is actually outperforming the quantum approach. But it is interesting to see that as you go to lower and lower temperature, as basically as your histograms get more and more structured, so basically here it's kind of like mean field works pretty well, you see that the Bethe ansatz approach actually starts not, getting, not doing so great. And here, 
what you can see is that with, la with three layers of a, of a circuit, in this particular case, I think we use five qubits, you see actually that the DDQCL, the learning approach, the KL divergence that you get is much lower than the classical one. So we are not claiming here any sort of quantum advantage or quantum supremacy. It's just as I said, it's an illustration to show that at least our learning approach is able to approximate wave functions that prepare these coherent thermal states. So basically, you are encoding the thermal probabilities in, in, a, in, a, in a wave function. That's, that's why they are called coherent thermal states. A last example actually goes to the Barson stripe itself is the learning of this. The nice thing of these approaches is that actually you're not restricted to any topology. And that's great for experimentalists because maybe, for example, the IBM device has a kind of like 2D type of grid, but maybe the ion trappers, they can actually have an all-to-all -all connectivity. The question is how can we address the power of those devices with this machine learning technique? And that's basically what you're seeing here. If I'm giving the Barson stripe and if I'm using DDQCL, Basically, you can see how is it improving actually with the number of layers of the circuit. So what's the computational power as you increase the number of layers? So for example, if you go from the start topology, the start topology is basically is that you have one central qubit that is connected in this way. You can do entangling gates between one, two, one, three, and one, four, versus for example, a chain topology, when actually you're restricted to nearest neighbor in the, in the entangling connectivities. And you can do the simulations and basically you can answer, you can ask the question, how well is the chain topology versus the start topology in actually reproducing this data set? And that's the type of question that you can get here. For example, it looks here like for this particular data set, the start topology is not, the chain topology is doing a little bit better than the start topology. But you see, of course, that the all to all topology is beating, is beating them all. So this type of question is the, is the type of, uh, the, is, this is, these are the type of questions that you can ask. And actually, from an experimental point of view, they are very, uh, very relevant. So here, actually, what I'm illustrating for you, uh, actually, this is the real experiment that was done by the group of Chris Monroe on the ion trap setting. So basically, the angles that you see here, here are the X rotations, here are the Z rotations, here are the XX, that's the molmer sorensen type of entangling gates. So what you see here is that we have a four qubit experiment, where actually here are the angles directly learned by our machine learning technique, and here are the type of histograms that you get. So in green, what you get, is the probability is coming from the experiment, and in red, that's the comparison from a fault tolerant, no error, uh, full, uh, this is a, this is a, quantum, quantum, a coherent uh, quantum computer. What you, see, what you see, of course, is that there is a mismatch between the theory and the experiment, and for example, if you count the precision, that is basically is what is the probability accumulated on the six bars and stripe patterns, you would get that for the theory is, is a, for the theory is 72%, and then for the experiment is 67. So you can already see that the precision is a proxy of how well the device is actually performing. So now notice, for example, that with two layers, and in this start topology, the power of this circuit itself is not that powerful. As you can see, for example, there is these two bars that they shouldn't be there. So the, quant the wave function itself, the circuit doesn't have enough power to remove these two bars from this histogram. When you go to four layers, the training actually is much better. As you can see, the six patterns are the most prominent ones, and you can see that the agreement between theory and experiment, again, is for the theory is 87%, for the experiment is 78%. Now you start seeing that the fact that you have more layers, you are seeing this life that actually you're seeing how much is it detrimental for the precision of the method. And finally, here is an all-to-all -all type of connectivity, and you can see pretty much that you can get with this a theoretical precision of one. So basically, you can pretty much reproduce the Barson stripe, and from the experiment, you get a 92%. Basically, there is a little bit of leakage into these states that shouldn't be there. But that comes directly from the experiment. So as I mentioned, for example, I, I started talking to my brother. We always wanted to, to work on this. And uh, for a while, or at least, in, my brother, is a, he's a mathematician. He works in differential geometry and works in optimization problem. So when I gave him, actually, I told him what we were doing on this optimization of these circuits. I told him, look, I mean, we've been trying just to get these parameters to see what's the best value that you can get in such a way that you lower this cost function. And actually, he told me, look, I mean, after, I mean, spending some time with this problem, he told me, just replace those point two by this arctangent square root of two divided two divided pi. And actually, what you will get is that that's very close to point two, but if you plug that in, actually, you get a KL divergence of exactly zero. 
So actually, he found an analytical solution for this particular toy problem. And we are actually, we're still, uh, I haven't talked to him because actually it was two days ago. But I found it very cool that at least uh, we now we have an, ins we can actually have a reference point of actually using some of the techniques that he's been developing in mathematics actually for maybe using them in, in actually getting some insights on these circuits. He just actually sent me an email yesterday that he found a degeneracy here on infinite solutions that you can find and how to set this angle. So, so I think certainly uh, that's the type of things that we are doing now, uh, in particular with my brother that he's more like in the math. So basically that, that, that is an exact solution of this problem. So finally, uh, this is one of my last slides is basically so what is the value of this? I mean, I mentioned the first part is the training. The second part is the benchmarking that we also emphasize. That's the other half of our paper. So we know, we, we, we heard already in the community of quantum volume. Quantum volume is a, is a, is a metric of how to address the power of these near-term devices. What we came up in this paper actually is a complementary approach that we call it the q score. And basically, it's a metric that is inspired of machine learning. Actually, it comes from the, we borrow some ideas from information retrieval that is called a F1 score. We call it just turn that into a Cuba score in such a way that we can measure experimentally they actually they get a one single number that will tell you how well you're doing in terms of the power of reproducing the, the, the bars and stripe data set. So basically, the very first step is you need to use DDQCL. You train the circuits. This is a stochastic approach, so we recommend you do it, let's say, 25 times. Then you use the median learned circuit, and then now you can compute this quantity. You can compute what is called the precision and the recall, and the recall is telling you just having an 100% precision, it doesn't mean that you're doing a good job. Because for example, you can always be hitting the same pattern and you get 100% precision. You need to show that you have enough diversity of the states. So that's what the recall is for. And in the terms of information retrieval, you wanna make sure that for example, if you make a query, you get, you get exposed to all the possible solutions. What experimentalists love about this metric itself is actually the number of measurements that you need to do in the lab to actually to compute the Cubas score. For example, for a 10 by 10, we're talking here Cuba, uh, uh, 10 by 10 bars and stripe, we get a 100 qubit device, then we can do this with only of the order of 6,000 measurements. And these are measurements in the computational basis. As I said, no fancy uh, projections or actually measurement of any other operators. It's just straight computational basis measurements. And then the F1, as I said, it's just a harmonic mean between the precision and the recall. With this, actually, I'm gonna finish about the calibration aspects. And this is an experiment that just happened last week. We started this collaboration through Qubitera with my, with, with my friend who decided to join, uh, Vicente Leighton. And basically, we get access to the, the, to the Rigetti device. What you're seeing here is, we're talking with Rigetti on doing the, the full-blown implementation of the DQCL on the device, and they gave us access to the device. One of the first experiments we wanted to do is a calibration experiment. So they told us, please do not touch please do not touch the, four, the qubit number four and nine because it's dysfunctional. Actually, it just happened two weeks ago, two, two days ago, we lost it. Or we actually, it's not working great and we're trying to fix it. And I said, great, that's actually the ones that we, we need. So we actually did experiment on those particular four qubits. And here you can see, indeed, that the QPU, the experimental results, certainly don't match the quantum simulations. As you can see, the histograms here is very poor, for example, for the state number four, you will see a huge discrepancy between the experiment and the theory. That's precisely what we wanted. So what's the next task? What we said is, can we use this and use our DDQCL to learn on this noisy device or imperfect device if we can learn actually the right distribution? And that's basically what we did. So we did on hardware the DDQCL and after let's say 50 iterations of the learning algorithms, you manage to lower the KL divergence from one unit already to 0 0.02, and as you can see, the matching between the hardware now and the theory is actually much better. Those are the pink lines versus the green lines. So for example, here, you see it's remarkable. For example, before, it was this discrepancy, and now the green and the, and the pink actually now match. So basically, this imperfect device, we were able to train it and to lead the device itself to actually to match still the, the reference histogram that we have. So with that, I mean, I think I will, I will that, that's my last slide, and basically, uh, yeah, so I would invite you to read this paper if you're curious about some of the work that we've done, and uh, yeah, so I'm opening for questions, thank you.
Time for a couple of questions. Um, Alejandro, I wonder if you have thought about um, using noise in these noisy devices as, regular, as regularization. And let me explain this quickly. So um, you had a couple of experiments where you tried to match a histogram. So you were given like your favorite solution, your favorite distribution, which was your data, and you try to match it. But this is, however, not obviously, as you know, the idea of machine learning. You never want to match your training data. You mm -hmm, want to mm -hmm. generalize from it. But maybe I'm preaching this a bit. So yeah. actually, in the community, optimization and generalization, I mean, optimization and machine learning is not the same thing, although we sometimes yeah, like mix it up. Anyways, so in your um, example, this would mean you don't want to learn the histogram, but you want to learn some kind of smooth distribution of yes. the histogram. And we don't even really know which smooth distribution. We just hope it works on the test set. Yeah. So now I'm thinking. In classical machine learning, people use dropouts and stuff, so they introduce yep. noise to actually like not hit the right solution, but something like a yep. little bit further away, and hope this is actually what what the real solution is. So I'm thinking of like this could be a nice research program to think of as if noise in intermediate quantum devices can do regularization. So yes. What are so, so let me. So what um, uh, in the, in the in the paper specifically, the task since actually since we wanted to come up with a metric itself. So we focus only on the task of actually just catching, actually getting the pattern. So it's kind of like a memory in reality, the way we're proceeding here. I completely agree with you. So the, if you really want to do kind of like a more like a learning and still pick up some generalization, then I would have not chosen actually the KL divergence because actually it's intractable to calculate in the first place. So what we propose in the paper is you can do the same thing that we do actually in, uh, when you're doing stochastically in a sense, and it's basically it's moment matching. So when, do we do, when you do moment matching, basically, I think that first of all, it's a tractable way to actually to do the whole learning procedure, and at the same way, you actually you can you can you can get more of a generalization that actually just trying to do overfitting like we are doing here. So moment matching would be a way, and you can still exploit the noise uh, of the device itself to try to to to. I mean, quantifying the degree of generalization is an interesting thing that that we haven't done, but in principle, that's one way. That would be the very first step is to move away from the from the KL because then otherwise you're overfitting. So we could have one more question while the next speaker prepares his computer. Uh, this one anymore? Here. This one here, Diego. Thank you. Um, in this last example with the Rigetti device, uh, I don't quite understand what kind of optimization, or like how did you change the uh, circuit to uh, match the expectation. Were you able to tune the uh, device, like the pulse parameters, or you just apply some series of imperfect gates in order to achieve the? Yeah. So no, basically no. The, the what we do is uh, we in our DDQCL type of framework, what we do is you always have the reference that's the pink, and then basically every cycle of the DDQCL you adjust the parameters. So if I actually program the parameters that in a fault-tolerant device, it's giving me this histogram. This is basically what you get, a complete discrepancy. So what you do in the DQCL is the machine learning technique, what it's doing is a, is a black box optimization where you move from these parameters, and then you probe the cost function, and you say, OK, am I actually matching better the histogram or not? And then you, you take, based on that, you take the next decision on where do you move. So basically, you're adjusting the parameters what, in, in the gates. In the, in the rotations, and the rotations and the entangling gate, the degree of entanglement and the degree of uh, rotations that you have in the gates, until actually you match the two histograms. So maybe we can close the talk here, Alejandro.